I was, uh, I was sharing this morning that we, uh, there aren't many organizations that we have back year after year. Um, we uh, seek to protect this time. We believe it's first and foremost a, a, a time to gather to worship, to focus on the Lord, to celebrate His work in our life. It is a family gathering. It's a time when as a body we can um, address things when we need to, but um, we try to be careful about that. But one of the organizations that we have back time after time, year after year, is uh, the Gideons because we, what, they, what they represent and what they do is so closely aligned with the heart and the mission of Woodland Park. We believe that the Word of God, um, utilized and working alongside of the Spirit of God, transforms lives, that people are saved as they hear and know and respond to the truth about Jesus Christ. And so, uh, gentlemen, thank you for what you do. Thank you for allowing us to partner with you. I was sharing today that when, um, when my father-in-law passed away this year, uh, we received a note in the mail that someone had purchased a number of Bibles in his, in his memory. And, um, and I can assure you that that, uh, that resource and that investment lasted a lot longer than most of the peace lilies and the other flowers that uh, Brian and the Black Thumb family uh, had in our home. And so, uh, so it is a great ministry. We encourage you to give. We encourage you to pray. I think some of you are at a station of life that maybe you're, you're wanting something to, to do. You believe that God has, has entrusted you with gifts and talents and opportunities and resources. And, um, and maybe you, this would be a ministry you would consider making your ministry to join with these men in taking the gospel to our region and ultimately around the world. I'd encourage you after the services are over, they'll be at the table right in front of the, um, where the restrooms are, right across there. And they would love to hear from you and to share with you. So I'd encourage you to take advantage of that. It is good to be back. I am thankful for a church who um, our leadership uh, supported and through your finances, you supported my opportunity to go to uh, the Dominican Republic this week. Flew out very early on Monday, returned pretty late on Friday. Had a great time spending with Tyler and Rachel and their kids. I want to show you a picture. This is one of the uh, first days that we were out and about and you'll see there, uh, one of the boys, I think they're five and six, if I remember correctly, uh, but they are lively, they are uh, fun, they are rambunctious, and they are absolutely beautiful. Uh, to hear this boy, these two boys who a couple of weeks ago had never met Tyler or Rachel, then to hear them calling them mama and papa, and to see them love on them, uh, they love to entertain Uh, The first night I had supper at their home and um, we had something that had like spaghetti noodles in it and probably for 20 minutes they took turns and they would get the noodle in their mouth and then they would would suck it up. And so then one did it and then they're, Brian, Brian, and then it had to be the other side. And so literally for 20 minutes, this is what we watched. But it was uh, was phenomenal. Tyler and Rachel, uh, the outset, the early days were very hard as you might imagine and any of you who've adopted can... I'll probably attest to that, and if you've done it internationally, you could truly attest to that. And so the language barrier and other challenges, but uh, they have settled into a routine. Uh, The boys are, um, they are growing and advancing the connectedness to the family. Um, The three girls are, I couldn't be, I told them, I couldn't be prouder of, of them and the selflessness they display and the love that they show toward their new brothers and um, it's a beautiful picture of the gospel, of adoption and of, of grace, and uh, I can't wait for them to get back. Uh, they're about, uh, for those of you who don't know, if you're relatively new, Tyler is our, our children's pastor. They've been gone about two months, and they believe that they still have another two months or so, probably mid-June to mid-July before they will get back. It is a lengthy process uh, for whatever reason involved there in uh, the Dominican Republic, but, uh, but God is blessing, and uh, it was such an encouragement. I literally carried two bags. I, about, I had about 110 or 20 pounds of stuff I carried, and uh, about um, 35 of that was mine, and everything else was stuff people donated or gave that I got to leave with them, and so it was, it was incredible. It felt like Santa Claus, um, and uh, it, was, it was awesome. Now, I will share with you, some of you noticed this red spot on my head. Maybe most, maybe if you are short enough, you wouldn't see it, but some of you would. And so um, when I bend down, you would. So you may wonder, like, what, what is that? Uh, uh, you may, did, does Brian have a birthmark we didn't know about? Does, um, uh, did, uh, did he try, like, some new hair transplant thing? Did he have some uh, cancer removed? No. What I had was these beautiful kids and this new toy with suction cups on them, and we all thought it'd be a great idea to pop one on my head and then to, and, and I promise you, when he, when they, it was, it was literally that popping sound and I thought nothing, I would, ha, oh, that's really funny until I got back to my hotel room 
and then was talking to Buffy via video that night, and, and, I ha- and I promise you it was four times darker than it is right now. And so I wore a hat the rest of the week because it was pretty embarrassing, but it made for a great story. And uh, if it does cause hair to grow there, I'm going to come, the whole head's going to be next week. So, but I don't think that's going to, uh, I don't think that'll be the case. But thank you again for your prayers, for your financial support, for the support of our leadership to even allow me to go. Um, I went to be an encouragement to them, and I believe I was, and I promise you they were an encouragement to, uh, to me. And so very grateful for that opportunity and thankful for a church who supports and believes in and has a heart for adoption in that way. Uh, that's, it was an incredible story. Speaking of, I want to talk about a story today, the story of the book of Acts. Have you ever, have you ever read a book or um, watched a movie or watched a streaming series and you got to the very end and it ends in a way that's really frustrating because instead of sort of tying up everything, it just leaves something open? Like it's very dissatisfying. Um, very, you've invested hours and sometimes months and in some cases years of watching something. And you come to the end and you want to see how it all resolves. You want to see how it all plays out. You want to see how it all comes together. And then nothing is resolved and it leaves you with more questions than answers. If, if you're not familiar with the book of Acts, then you're going to discover this morning that this this, these final verses, and we've been in this journey now for multiple months, and the last several months has been this pressing of Paul from Jerusalem to Rome, and, 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 and Paul's going to go and to be before Caesar, and what we're going to find is a very dissatisfying ending. Because we will not be told there's no showdown between Paul and Nero. There's, there's no telling us, did Paul get out of prison? Did he remain in prison? Did he get killed? We don't know. We, it literally does not tell us here in the text, in the book of Acts. But the reason is, and I think this is an important reason, is that Luke's primary responsibility, Luke's primary heart for writing this book is not to, tell, is not to share a biography of Peter in the first half and Paul in the second The book of Acts is not biographical about Paul. Paul is not the hero of the story. Jesus is the hero of the story. And what he says at the very beginning of this book is that the first writing, the the Gospel of Luke, was about what Jesus began to do and to teach. And therefore, the book of Acts is about what Jesus is continuing to do and to teach. But now he is doing it through his people, empowered by the Spirit who has come. And so while the book of Acts will come to an end, the mission doesn't. The mission continues. It's as if Acts 29 is being written out and we are a part of that ongoing, unfolding story that God is writing in our world of reaching people from every tribe, nation, tongue, family group to reach all peoples of the world with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The mission lives on. We are the ongoing living out of that mission that we see in Peter, in Paul, in the early church. It remains our mission today. And what I want us to see this morning is that here in these last few verses, Paul, once again, we see a number of key characteristic traits that are part of Paul's life that enabled him to faithfully live out the mission of God and to be fruitful for the kingdom of God in incredible ways. And if we want to join and to be faithful to that mission, I would suggest that these are three traits that we should be inviting God to produce and develop and mature in us daily and moment by moment so that we fulfill his mission until Christ returns. Three things, a passion for people, an unwavering commitment to the gospel, And thirdly, fruit-producing faithfulness wherever God leads. Look with me if you would. First of all, what enables Paul to to live out this mission? What is it that we would want to embrace? We find in Paul it is a passion for people. Pick up at verse 16 with me if you would. Luke writes that when we entered Rome, remember Paul, again, he's following Paul in this journey, but Luke is a part of this traveling group, and so he's telling this firsthand. When we entered Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who was guarding him. So don't skip too quickly past this because, again, for multiple chapters, Paul has been through all sorts of moments where it would seem that getting to Rome was impossible. He is, uh, he is attacked. He is on the verge of being murdered, put, killed by the Jews in the temple complex. He is, uh, he is under uh, facing the possibility of death before the Romans. He finds himself shipwrecked in the middle of a hurricane. He, he finds himself um, bitten by this venomous snake we saw last week. Like again and again, there seems to be every obstacle to Paul getting to Rome. But again and again, Paul is told, Paul, God has told Paul, Paul, you're going to get there. You're going to stand before Caesar. You're going to bear fruit in Rome. You're going to encourage believers there. You're going to see a harvest of people there. And Paul has arrived. 
And when Paul gets there, he's not sort of locked away in some, some dark dungeon somewhere in some cave or down in the ground or in some dark part of the city. He, he's in essence staying in his own Airbnb, but he is accompanied by a guard at all times. He can't go out, but people can in fact come to him. And Paul's not there for long, verse 17, notice. He's not there but three days, and he's already reaching out to and inviting the Jewish leaders, probably the leaders of the local synagogues to come. Verse 17, after three days, Paul called together those who were leading men of the Jews, and when they came together, he began saying to them, Brethren, his fellow Jews, he still identifies with them, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans." And when they had examined me, they were willing to release me because there was no ground for putting me to death. We have seen this consistently again and again. Every Roman authority from the commander that was there and arrested him to the, uh, to the governors in Caesarea to uh, King Herod Agrippa. When he arrives, every single one of them hears Paul's story and says, this guy's done nothing to be in prison, let alone to be executed. But it's only to appease the, the Jewish leaders of Jerusalem who hated Paul and who wanted to see him dead that he continues to be imprisoned. When the Jews objected, verse 19, I was forced to appeal to Caesar. This is what leads him now and gets him on his trip to Rome. Not that I had any accusation against my nation. In other words, I'm not coming here because I'm bringing some attack against my people. I'm coming here as a defendant. I'm the one on, uh, that's on trial. I'm the one people are lashing out against. For this reason, verse 20, therefore, I requested to see you and speak to you. For I am wearing this chain, you can imagine him showing, for the sake of the hope of Israel. Paul says, this is really, like, if it all boils down, this is why I'm here. Because I dare to believe that this Jesus is the Christ, is the Messiah, is the long-awaited one of God, who died, who rose, who is alive, and is the one whereby we can be saved and know God. He is the, the redeemer of God's people. He is, the re, he is the transformer of lives. And because I dare to believe this and because the Jewish authorities do not, this is really the rub. This is really the issue here. And these Jewish leaders who've come to him from Rome say, verse 21, we've neither received letters from Judea concerning you, none of the brethren come here and report or speak anything bad about you, but we desire to hear from you. We want to hear what you have to say and what your views are for concerning this sect, this religion, the, the followers of the way, Christianity. It is known to us, it is spoken against everywhere. So Paul's heart has been to go to Rome. He wrote in Romans 1 how he's praying, he's looking for a door of opportunity, and he finally gets there. And, and the very first thing that he does three days in is to reach out to the Jewish leaders and ask them to come to where he's at. Now, if you know the book of Acts at this point, if you've been with us on this journey at this point, then you know how this is going to play out. Because this never works out very well. Every time the Jewish authorities are with Paul, most of them will reject the gospel, reject the truth. They further want to see Paul persecuted. They want to see him dead. They want to see him run out of town, some challenge. And so you would think like, like human instinct at some point would kick in and you would think that Paul would say, I don't think I'm going to do this again. I think this time I'll just go into town and invite the Gentiles. They seem to be more open. So I think I'll just focus on them and not go through all of this craziness with the Jewish leaders again. And yet here he is doing it. First thing he does, he's in town three days. He's inviting them to, to come. Wow, because Paul never gave up on his people and I believe uh, he says in Romans 1, 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul believed that Christ was the Messiah who came from among God's people and that to those people he should first go. And then as they rejected, he would go to the Gentiles as God had called him to. But he always started there. Every time we've seen this. He shares it with the Jews. They oppose it. He turns to the Gentiles. We see it in Acts 13 in Antioch. We see it in Acts 18 at Corinth. We see it in Acts 19 in Ephesus. So why? Why in the world does Paul keep putting himself in this situation? Why would he, from our perspective, keep wasting his time with this group of people who doesn't want to hear what he has to say? I think we get a hint in a writing from Paul to the Romans a couple of years earlier, it's believed, when he, when he wrote in Romans 1 how he's praying and longing to be there and to reap a harvest there and to encourage the believers there. In that same book in Romans 9, listen to what he writes in verse 1. I am telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. 
For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Paul says, I would embrace eternal hell if it meant that my fellow Jews would know and love and follow Jesus. I would be willing to eternally suffer separation from God if in some way doing so would mean that my fellow Jews, my, my, these men and women, a part of God's people, would know and trust and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's heart is so burdened. His passion is so great for his people that if he could, he would willingly spiritually die in order that they could live and know God forever. And so here he is once again, a new city, inviting the leaders to come, sharing his heart, this unrelenting passion to see the Jewish people come to know and trust and follow Jesus. I believe that if we are going to continue to live out the mission, if we're going to continue to, if the work of the early church is going to continue through Woodland Park and through your life and mine today, that same unrelenting passion to see people know and love and follow Jesus will need to be a part of our heart and our lives as well. And the question is, where does that come from? I often hear people who say, well, even if we don't agree with, the, with, with what, the, um, what the Mormons, the Latter-day Saints would be teaching, but, but, but we really we applaud them and the, um, the Jehovah's Witnesses and what they do and getting out there and going door to door. Isn't it awesome that they, they might be wrong about some things, but, but they so love God that this is why they, do you know why they're out there doing? They're out there doing what they're doing to earn their way into the favor of God. They're doing what they're doing because for them, it, it, it involves these steps to get into right standing with God so that they can be with God and experience God as they understand him for eternity. It's, it's, not, it's not compelled out of love. It's compelled out of, of trying to do enough good to, to get into heaven and to be with God. We don't operate that way. We're not, we're not trying to do any, we acknowledge in fact that there is nothing we can do to make ourselves right with God. That, that in fact it's all been done through Christ, through his death, through his burial, through his resurrection. That through faith in him, that's how we know God. So what would compel us to have a burden for others to know and to love Jesus? Why not just say, well, I'm good, got my ticket on my way. Good luck to you suckers, I'm good over here. Like what would compel people to go to other countries? What would compel us to to give the support missions? What would compel us to give so that the Bibles are given out? What would compel us to, to take the risk to talk to somebody who has rejected us before that we would tell them again about the gospel? What would compel Paul to go to the Jewish people again and again despite their continual rejection? Paul writes to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died, and he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. And then he goes on to describe how we are ambassadors for Christ. I will tell you what keeps our heart attuned to and passionate about reaching lost people. It is not some guilt or shame or trying to earn or deserve or measure up to leadership expectation or God's expectation, like we're trying to rise at the level. We're trying to level up to what our, our, our heavenly mansion will be like. We're trying just to get in by the skin of our teeth. We're trying to cover up all the bad in our life by doing enough good, by reaching people. What compels us is that we are absolutely convinced that Jesus, God the Son, left the glory and splendor and beauty of heaven and entered into our world and lived a sinless life so that on the cross he bore our sin, he bore our shame, he took our place, he rose and he conquered death on the third day through his resurrection that he is alive and that through faith in him he has invited us to know God, to have a relationship with God, to find life in him. What motivates our evangelism is our worship. When we see him high and lifted up, when we see him for, in the beauty and the splendor of all that is true of him, this is what compels us to go. We, so, we, we want Christ to be exalted in every heart and in every, we want his kingdom expanded.
committed one life, one soul at a time, that as people trust Christ and Christ reigns in them, then Jesus is put on display through that person. And we believe that Jesus is so beautiful, is so amazing, is so glorious, that we want as many people as possible to reflect Christ to the watching world. This is why we go. This is why we give. This is why we share. This is why we serve. This is why we embrace rejection. This is why we keep going to hard places and hard people. Because his love compels us to do so. A second trait is not only this passion for people, but number two is an unwavering commitment to the gospel. Verse 23, when they had set a day for Paul... A, second, a day for this second meeting for them to come back to where, he, again, he can't go where they are, but they can come to where he is. They came to him at his lodging in large numbers, and notice what Paul does. He was explaining to them by solemnly testifying about the kingdom of God and trying to persuade them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and from the prophets from morning until evening. This is, we've seen this consistently throughout the book of Acts, Paul's unwavering commitment to declare, proclaim, share the good news of Jesus Christ wherever God places him. And notice how he does so. And I like the wording I'd read somewhere. And so I, I, I thought I want to share. So he says that he shared from morning till evening, from cover to cover and from heart to heart. What do I mean by that? It says that he, they shared from morning until evening that day. Paul, Paul doesn't like give some five-minute testimony and then he walks away and, and then like, no, he, is, he gives all day to explaining, to laying out, to setting forth facts and truth in order to help them understand how Jesus is in fact the Christ, the promised Messiah, the one of God. He invests considerable time. And sometimes lost people take considerable investment. It's not gonna, it may not happen in a single moment or a single conversation. It may be multiple conversations over an extended period of time of explaining and sharing in order for them to know and to trust and follow Jesus. Paul does that from morning till evening. Notice from cover to cover. It says that he unfolds from the scriptures, from both the law of Moses and the prophets. So the whole of the Old Testament He is sharing how Jesus is the hero of this story, how Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promise, how Jesus is the ruler of God's kingdom who reigns in hearts of those who surrender to him. He taught the word of Christ and the Christ of the word from cover to cover and then from heart to heart. I love this. I was sharing this morning that um, unashamedly, unashamedly, every pastor of Woodland Park who, who teaches, who shares, um, every, I believe every area of ministry, children, students, youth, uh, adults, young adults, senior adults, like across the spectrum, our passion for you is not to come so that you bring a notebook and you fill it up with notes or you have your Bible and you're able to mark it with markings and we unfold for you a bunch of facts that you then just close up your book and walk away from every single Sunday. This is not a college. We're not teaching calculus and um, biology. This is not a lecture hall where we just share information and then you just have more facts now in your head and therefore you're better educated. Unashamedly, our passion is what Paul says. He was trying to persuade them concerning Jesus. Every single week and in everything we do in the life and ministry of Woodland Park, our heart is not to educate you. We call ourselves a teaching church and we certainly want to be faithful to teach and instruct in the word of God to help people understand what it says so that you can then apply it and live it out. But make no mistake about it. Our goal, our passion, our aim, our drive is not just to embellish with information. It is to point you to Jesus and hope that we can, by the spirit of God, you might be persuaded to love Jesus, to trust Jesus, to surrender to Jesus, to live for Jesus, to honor Jesus, Jesus with every area and fabric of your life and of your being. Amen? Thank you. Yes. Heart to heart. As a result then, verse 24, some were persuaded, others would not believe. Paul had to get the last word in, so he quotes from Isaiah 6, 9, and 10. 
which is fascinating because this is quoting from the, the call. Remember, Isaiah has this vision of the Lord, and the Lord says, says, who will go for me? Who will I send? And Isaiah says, here I am, Lord, send me. And then a part of what God says to him is, okay, Isaiah, I'm going to send you out to people whose ears will be closed, whose hearts will be dulled, whose, who will not hear, who will not see, who will not understand, who will not respond to what you're going to say. That sounds like a great assignment, God. Thank you. And yet that's, that's, that's part of what God called him to for, for whatever reason, for God's glory. And Paul says here, notice, of those who walked away, of those who rejected the truth, of those who would not hear and respond to the work of the Spirit of God and to the truth of the gospel, verse 26, go to this people, he's quoting Isaiah 6, 9, and 10. Go to this people and say, you will keep on hearing but will not understand. You will keep on seeing but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. Where their ears they scarcely hear. They have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they would see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return. And God says, and I would heal them. Therefore, verse 28, let it be known to you, Paul says to these leaders, that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles and they will also listen. Verse 29 says they left sort of arguing with, disputing among themselves. The majority of the Jewish leaders reject the truth. They hear it, they see it physically with their ears, they can see with their eyes, but, but spiritually their eyes and ears are closed to the truth and they are reflecting the hearts of their ancestors who God spoke and God warned. And we'll see this in Hosea in a few weeks, that, that God was warning his people. And again and again, they would not hear the warning. They would not respond. They would not, do, they would not hear what God had to say. They have closed their ears. They have hardened their hearts. And Paul says, this is the condition of those who are rejecting that day. But he says, the Gentiles will hear. And therefore, God is calling me to go. And I will keep sharing. I will not be silenced. This is part of the reality that wherever the gospel is declared, there's always a division. Those who accept and those who don't. Those who receive and those who reject. And you and I don't get to choose. We're not responsible for the response. We are responsible for our obedience to the Spirit's leading to declare the gospel. And so remember, Jesus told the parable of the sower and the seeds and the, the various forms of ground. And, and the disciples would later ask him, like, what does all that mean? And he says, the seed is the word of God going forth. And the ground is, is um, a picture of the hearts of people. And some people will uh, immediately reject the truth. Some people will seemingly hear it for a time and then reject it. Others will receive the word and it will bear fruit in their lives. It will become good soil again. Wherever the word of God goes, we, don't, we, we can't control the response, but we are responsible for our obedience to proclaim the truth of the gospel. And Paul did that in every situation he could. He's under house arrest, and yet he opens up his home and invites people to come. Three days there, he's inviting the Jewish leadership to come and to build a relationship with them, to, to share truth. Paul's humble, gracious, tactful, biblical in his sharing. He's passionate in reaching people. He focuses on Jesus. And it seems that people would come from far and wide to hear what Paul had to say because Paul, Paul believed what he was sharing. Someone has said the best form of advertising is a satisfied customer. And that's true, isn't it? Um, I'm much more likely to go and try a new restaurant if one of my good friends says I went, man, the food was amazing, the service was incredible, the price is good, like it is worth it. You should. Have. I am much more likely to go if I hear that than I am if I just look at some advertisement or see something on Facebook or hear something. No, that, that satisfied customer prompts um, me to want to go and experience. I believe that one of the greatest um, uh, tools that God can use for the advancement of the gospel is uh, people who have truly been transformed by the gospel and really believe what we're saying. And sometimes, frankly, by the way that we carry ourselves, by the absence of joy in our hearts, by the sour looks on our face, I don't, we don't really look like people who believe what we are saying. People will often ask, as a pastor, like, what's our strategy for growing the church? And we've had people leave. We've had people come. We have seats that are empty only. So what's, our, what's the strategy for getting more people here? 
Is there some online presence? Is there some, some advertising, something? We're, like, what, what are we going to do? Almost like, okay, we've got this, you know, this, we're, we're, we're um, some company, we're some business. So what's our, what's our business model? What's our plan? What are we going to do? Listen, plans A, B, C, D, and E for the growth of Woodland Park is the same. It's you. It's you. It's men and women who are so in love with Christ and so blown away by the grace and the beauty of what God has done in your life that, that like Paul, you can't stop talking about him. You cannot be silenced and therefore you want to tell anybody and everybody everywhere about Jesus. And as we are in love with him and out of our love for him, we are compelled to tell others about him. God will grow his church. But if you're looking for some formula or like some business proposal or some well laid out strategy, a lot of that, frankly, is man made garbage that will last for a season but will not last for long. The growth of the people of God, the growth of his church is carried out by the growth of God's people sharing God's good news wherever it is that God has placed you. And so if you're looking for, if I'm looking for some new savior to come into the room, some, some certain person that's going to arrive and they're going to drive that, and then you're waiting on the, listen, you are the answer to that prayer for growth. Lord, let me so love you that it's natural that I want to tell other people about you. That the gospel has radically changed my life. And when you do that, then listen, like Paul, you can begin to look around and say, okay, what God, how might you want to use my home to, to help bring people in so I can talk to them about Jesus? How, how would you want to use my circumstances? And we see that a bit more in this third and final point. How, how, how do we stay on mission? How do we join God and what he's doing and continuing to do as an extension of the book of Acts? We, like Paul, we need a passion for people. We need an unwavering commitment to the gospel. And thirdly, and I'll make this quick, we need fruit-producing faithfulness wherever God leads. Now, again, if you weren't prepared for this, this is, this is a, we've been on a multiple month, like over almost a year and a half journey together through the book of Acts. And here's how it ends. Look at verses 30 and 31. And he stayed two full years in his own rented quarters and was welcoming all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness unhindered. Wait, what about Nero? What about this appeal to Caesar? And you've got to stand before him. Like, did you get there? Did you, did you have that opportunity? How did that go? Paul, did you, did you, did you get out of prison? Did you stay in? Like, what, what happened next? We don't know. We're not told. Luke ends on this triumphant note. Paul has made it to Rome. Paul is preaching the gospel. People are being transformed. People are coming. Paul's welcoming Jews and Gentiles, Greeks and Romans alike. Anybody who wants to come is coming. He's sharing the gospel with all who would come his way. He's in chains. The gospel is not. He's continued to declare the good news. Every situation, every circumstance that he's in throughout this book and even here while he's in prison in Rome, Paul is declaring the gospel. And because he has surrendered to Christ, his, the prison even becomes a pulpit for him. What we find is that Paul remains faithful wherever God leads. And because of that faithfulness, God produces fruit out of his life. Luke says that he proclaims the gospel there from his home with openness, unhindered, publicly, forcefully, boldly. Most scholars believe that during this time of imprisonment that Paul writes the letters of Philippians, Colossians, Ephesians, Philemon. Some of, most of us would say those would be in our top favorite books, Philippians, Ephesians, certainly, like some of our favorite books of the Bible. Those were written while Paul is in prison during this time. In Philippians 1, about those guards that would take care of Paul who were watching over Paul, Philippians 1, listen to what it says. Paul, Philippians 1, 12, one of the letters that is believed to be written by Paul during this season. I want you to know, Paul writes, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole praetorian guard and to everyone else. 
and that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Paul says, actually being in prison has advanced the gospel. My struggle has encouraged others to continue to declare the gospel. And, and, it's, and, and the opportunity is afforded such that the whole praetorian guard is aware of the gospel. In fact, by the end of that same letter, Philippians 4, 21, Paul is right. He says, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. That's not just Caesar's family. That's those who serve Caesar, those officials, those governing authorities, those governing officials like the guards. See, I believe that Paul never viewed himself as being chained to the, to the guards. I think he saw the guards as being chained to him. And so Paul is continually, he will not shut up. He will not stop talking about Jesus. And so these guys are locked down to him day after day, month after month for two years. And we can imagine that their, their experience of the gospel and what they saw of the power of God in Paul's life brought many of them to trust and to believe in Christ as well. So even when chained as a, to a guard, even when limited and he can't leave his house, even when unable to go out and about and do whatever he would want to do, Paul still seeks every avenue possible to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I say that to say this, that there are, um, we have said this many times throughout this study and during my time here, that, uh, that you are where you are because God has put you there. And if we would trust that a sovereign God knows what he is doing in our world and as he is carrying out his mission through us, he strategically places us where we belong, then if we would view life through that lens, then instead of living and saying, well, when I get to that situation or get to that circumstance, then I'll minister or then I'll have a ministry. Instead of sitting around and complaining about, I don't like my house, I don't like my neighborhood, I would say, God has placed me here. This is my mission field for this season. My boss is difficult. My coworkers are challenging, but God has placed me here. I am on, this is my mission field. This is where God has placed me for, for this moment in my life. I may not like Chattanooga. I may not like Sida Daisy. I may not like Ringgold. I may not like wherever it is that you live. And so one day when I get to somewhere else that I really like, then I'll begin to minister. For now, I'm just going to suffer through and suck it up and hope for the rest. No, this is where God has placed me. This is where God is allowing me to be. This is what God has for me in my life in this season. As we begin to view life in that way and surrender to God in that way, then as we are faithful to him where he places us, then we will become fruitful for him for his glory. Psalm 37 says, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. You guys are creative. You're able to think creatively and imaginatively. Part of it is because you have been made in the image of a creative and imaginative God. And so take what God has put at your disposal I thought about this morning, I don't know if this is a good picture or not, but I, when my kids were young and they would get those Lego sets and we would spend hours putting all the pieces together just right and then sometimes a few days later all the pieces end up scattered again and next time they didn't use their instructions, now it was just taking all the pieces and to make whatever their imagination would make. My challenge to you is to take all the Lego pieces of your life, if you will, stop trying to fit it into some certain mold you want it to be, some certain thing you want, and put it all before the Lord and say, Lord, my life's yours. Where I live, who I live among, who I interact with, who I'm alongside of, who I talk to, who, who is around me. God, all of these are a part of your sovereign plan for my life. And so, God, I want to be yielded to you so that where I am, I would be faithful. And as a result, there would be, I would be, that would be fruitful, that you would bear your fruit out in my life. And he will do that. So Luke concludes this book in this weird, abrupt ending. Most scholars believe, by the way, that Paul eventually does get released and uh, goes on a fourth mission journey and eventually, though, is uh, arrested again by the Romans and later beheaded under Nero's decree. But again, Acts ends in this strange way because the story is still unfolding, because we are a part of the story, because the mission is still marching forward. That the same Jesus who was working in and through those believers, 
by the power of the Spirit of God through his people to advance the gospel is the same Jesus working through us by the power of the Spirit of God in us to advance the gospel in our world today. And so as I was thinking and praying in the last day or two, like, Lord, what, what response would you want to provoke in your people from this passage today? For whatever reason, what came to my mind this morning is, um, is a need for God's people to fall in love with Christ all over again. Because I believe that if we love him with all of our hearts, the natural outgrowth of that is we will want to tell others. I just wonder if we were honest with ourselves, if we would be real before the Lord and in our own hearts with the Holy Spirit prompting and stirring and... um, Disturbing where needed. Is it possible that for a lot of us, um, we have become complacent with God? We have um, relegated God to like a back burner. We treat him like a, like a side hustle in our lives. We got our life over here and then God enters in on occasion. But does it still... Does it still blow your mind that God the Son left heaven to come to earth to rescue you? I think about Tyler and Rachel and this adoption. And Tyler and Rachel didn't go to the Dominican Republic and have um, an organization parade a bunch of kids out in front of them. And they just got to choose. I think that kid could do things in our house. That kid looks like he could drive a mean vacuum cleaner, and I, we need that at our house. With that kid, that girl looks like she could really wash dishes. We need one of those. No, they didn't parade them and choose based on what they could. Completely blind, if you will. Those boys did nothing to earn to deserve being brought into that family. It's purely the love of God through Tyler and Rachel and those three girls that have been embracing them, those boys and bringing them in. And likewise, you and I did nothing. We do nothing to make ourselves worthy of being a part of the family of God. And yet God in His grace positioned you to hear the gospel, to respond to the gospel, to be transformed by the gospel, to be adopted into his family, to be declared holy when there was nothing holy about you or about me, to give us purpose, to give us meaning, to give us direction, to give us joy and peace and a reason to get up and to live in the morning. Does that still blow your mind? Here's what I would invite us to do this morning because I think this is what will propel the mission in our lives in our day today is I would invite us just to bow our heads and close our eyes where we are for just a moment. Not not because there's something super religious about that, not because uh, uh, like I'm going to have you to enter into some seance. I'm not trying to manipulate your emotions or feelings. I just want you for a moment to shut out the noise and the activity and the things around you that you might see or hear or pay attention to and just for a moment with you and the spirit of God inside of you if you're a believer would you ask the Holy Spirit to give you a fresh glimpse of how beautiful, glorious, wonderful, powerful, transformative, amazing, gracious, good Jesus is. So that his love will compel you, will control you and lead you to unashamedly and creatively Declare the gospel with your words and with your life. Ask him, God, help me to fall in love with you all over again. Whatever idols I put before you, whatever I love more than you, whatever I trust, whatever I live for, whatever I'm more passionate about than you, God, put it in its rightful place in my heart today. 
Let me see you more clearly so that my passion for you and your amazing love toward me would compel me to keep going, to keep sharing, to bear fruit and be faithful right where you've placed me at this season in my life. Ask him to do that in you today. If you're here today and you've never trusted Christ, you've never surrendered to him, Paul went through all of this because the gospel is worthy of being taken to, to the nations because God wants all of humanity to be able to hear and respond to, to the good news that Christ died for you, that Christ rose, that God loves you, that God has a plan and purpose and desire to live in and through you. And if you will surrender to him, God will, God will begin his good work in you and through you for the rest of your life. If you've never done that, then right where you're seated, you can call out. The first step is not to come forward. It's not anything I can do for you. It is a cry from your heart to God to say, God, today, I am persuaded that you are who you say you are, that you have done what you say you have done on the cross and to your resurrection. And today, I surrender to you. Come live this life through me. Save me, forgive me, lead me from this day forward. As you cry out to him, that's a prayer he'll hear and respond to every single time. God, thank you for the gospel. It is, it's not just good news, it's the best news. And Lord, I pray that our passion to take the gospel to our neighbors and to the nations would not grow out of some artificial guilt or some attempt to appease you or to, to prove something to the people around us. I pray that none of us would leave here this morning trying to muster up something in ourselves except that we would be fully surrendered to you, fully sold out in our love for you, blown away that you would love us, save us, adopt us, transform us. And that God, now you could use people like us empowered by your spirit to keep taking this good news to the nations. God, let it be so. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.